the gold seekers that came to New Zealand were Cantonese peasant people. They were intending to be brief laborers and then leave. Why did they stay? As someone that grew up in these areas, I always grew up knowing that there was a, a Chinese influence. People like Peter Chin, who became Dunedin's mayor, the first Chinese mayor. People like Jim Ning. Jim had that connection with our local community, but all of a sudden, things got brought to life. The Guangdong Museum of Chinese Nationals Residing Abroad is the only provincial museum for overseas Chinese history in China. It covers an area of 6,000 square metres, showcasing the harsh immigrant history, cultural heritage and the connection to mainland China for overseas Chinese. Today, it has special visitors from the Otago Settlers Museum. The Otago Settlers Museum is a regional history museum in Dunedin, New Zealand. Founded in 1898, the museum concerns the history of settlers who arrived since the Otago Gold Rushes in 1861, and part of the mining settlers originated from Guangzhou, Guangdong. The reason for the Otago Settlers Museum's visit to Guangzhou goes back to 2014, a young American, George McKibbins, who works on historical preservation, found a group of old Canton photos taken by Kiwi missionaries from about 100 years ago. These photos triggered a documentary filming by Guangdong Radio and Television. A bustling harbour along the Pearl River, the Sacred Heart Cathedral and the Zhenhai Tower. Floods submerge Guangzhou streets. Japanese bomber planes flying over Bayou Mountain. And the pioneer gold seekers in New Zealand. Over 2,000 old photos of Guangzhou are buried in an overseas archive. And unveiled an almost forgotten history on the first connection between Guangzhou and New Zealand. William McKee, exhibition developer of Otago Settlers Museum. Sean Brosnahan, Otago Settlers Museum curator. They are working on a project tracking the roots of Otago Chinese and will tell us the history of how Chinese miners survived when they arrived in New Zealand for the first time. Welcome to FaceTime. My name is George McKibbins and today I'm sitting here at the Guangzhou Overseas Chinese Museum with two very special guests. Sean and William represent the Otago Settlers Museum in the South Island of New Zealand and they are here shooting a documentary about the first Chinese diaspora to settle in their country. Sean, William, thank you. Well, thanks for having us. Now, Sean William, two years ago, I myself and some other colleagues, we put together a photo exhibit at the Guangzhou Library that was from your country. It was an exhibit put together on be with the Presbyterian Research Center in New Zealand, and they were taken by Presbyterian missionaries who lived and worked in Guangzhou in the 19th century through the early 20th century. And two years ago, that had a tremendous impact on the city. but the story we didn't tell was the story of the miners themselves. So right, yeah. can you give us a background of who these people were, the people who came from Guangzhou during the Qing Dynasty and first settled in your country to make a new life? Sure, well I mean the gold seekers that came to New Zealand were Cantonese peasant people and the key thing about the Otago, the New Zealand uh, gold seekers was that they were invited to come because Otago had suffered uh, a setback in that new gold fields had been discovered elsewhere and all the European labourers had just debunked to this new field leaving the Otago fields with still plenty of gold but no one to work them. So it was a crisis for Otago and they sent an invitation over to Victoria in Australia where they knew there was a big body of Cantonese gold seekers who were hard workers and who specialised in reworking older ground and that appeal brought the very first groups to Otago. And once they began to succeed in getting gold and sending money home to their home villages, a new flow began to develop directly from Guangdong. 
That's interesting. So there was a direct invitation. There's a direct invitation which really marks it off from Australia, where from the beginning the Cantonese gold seekers were unpopular, were reviled, were intimidated and persecuted. Whereas in Otago, they didn't just come over in, in response to the invitation, they demanded some guarantees. What kind of guarantees? That they would be treated equally with Europeans, that they would not face any extra taxes or discrimination, and that there would be provision made for uh, interpreters and that sort of thing. And those guarantees were offered and were honoured for the whole period in which the Otago provincial government existed. Give me a, a time frame, a decade when this... When this uh... From 1866, when the first miners began to arrive, until 1876, when the provincial government was abolished, and then there was a new, new sort of situation because administration passed to a national level, and also New Zealand at that point, in the late 1870s and early 1880s, went into an economic decline, and pressure began to mount with those Chinese workers now becoming competitors for European labour, and that's when anti-Chinese discrimination began. Competing with Western miners, Chinese miners had to face another challenge, adapting to the climate. Different climates between Guangzhou and New Zealand meant hardships for the Chinese. Tell me the reality of the lives of these gentlemen who left their families in the north, from the northern part of Guangzhou, settled in New Zealand. What was their daily routine? What, what, was their, what were their living conditions? Leaving from where they came from here it was equally as hard, I'd say, when they got over there. Um, but we've just experienced in the last few days the heat from here. Currently back there it's, it's sitting at zero, so they weren't necessarily equipped correctly when they got over there. Most of them seldom had footwear, correct clothing, and very ramshackle sort of um, dwellings as well, um, some of which still exist. But the, the pictures are mostly, they look like self-built huts. Can oh, yeah. we talk about They made them from whatever was available to hand. So in a lot of places in central Otago, there's a lot of um, schist rocks, mm -hmm. and so they would construct often sort of caves and overhangs and, and sort of gullies and they would just build walls. We've been in a lot of these places because they're just oftentimes still there today. And the thing that comes across I think with those miners is the contrast in the climate would have been stunning. Because here, you know, it's it's really warm and, you know, tropical sort of you know, yeah, it's a hot place. Okay. And lush and there's, and there's you know richness about the soil, you know, sort of three crops a year. Come to Central Otago, it's a very arid environment. You know it's, it's quite a stunning landscape, absolutely beautiful, but harsh, dry, hot, freezing cold in the winter, um, very little food there. Um, so how do people survive? Well, one of, the big, um, one of the big things that made a difference to people were the Chinese, because they pioneered market gardening and orchards. You know, as well as doing their gold operations, they began to grow things, and from a very early point, they were selling fruit and vegetables, which made a big difference and actually impacted on other miners who were suffering sometimes from scurvy, from the lack of those sort of things being available. But these Chinese miners, they were living in separate camps, am I right? There was, was this very, uh, uh, yeah, very uh, salient. I, I only actually in a couple of places were there set camps. They tended to congregate on the edge of European towns, but in terms of the gold fields, they were just speckled all around the place, wherever they had a claim, and they would build But their also, it would be a good time to maybe mention that yeah. initially when they came over, they weren't Chinese as such. They were more an individual uh, county, county, groups, county yeah. groupings, oh, and yeah. they had their, often had their own merchants back in Dunedin that would supply them all the way back to Guangdong. Yeah. Um, so they, a lot of the, in these very isolated places, they actually ate Chinese food that came on yeah. horseback or whatever all the way down because that's what they knew and that's what they could get sorted out from their merchants and their agents back over here. Yeah, those merchants were really critical because they set up the sort of the infrastructure that bought new miners from Hong Kong, they arranged the passages on the ships, they'd get them to Dunedin, they'd grub stake them, they'd set them up with the equipment and the food and they'd lend them the money for their mm -hmm. passages, then they would go up to the gold fields, they would earn and pay off the debts they owed to the merchants and the merchants had storekeepers all over the place so you had Jung Seng people being looked after by Jung Seng merchants, you had Pernu people being looked after by Pernu merchants, Toysan people being looked after by Toysan merchants. It was very county specific. Some years later, there were too many Chinese moving to New Zealand. They formed a Chinese camp in the outskirts of town and gradually became a problem in the mining area. How the invitation of the 1850s or 1860s transformed to the poll tax system of the 1880s. How, how, did, how did we go from that, from that period? Well, you went from that period to the other because in the first period, the 1860s and 70s, there was plenty of gold. It was a prosperous era. Mm -hmm. And the Chinese weren't so much competitors with Europeans as they were filling a need 
their labour was needed. It was needed in the goldfields, it was needed on the farms, it was needed in building railways. So there was a space for them and it didn't threaten the European people with the same era. But in the 1880s things turned, tightened up, gold was getting harder to find, you needed a much bigger sort of level of operation with sluicing and quartz mining and all those sorts of things to get gold anymore. And so Chinese began to become competitors for labouring contracts on the roads and railways and there was desperate you know, unemployment. So they began to clash in their needs and then they became really unpopular. We, we can see, say, from this museum, <clears throat> there's pictures of uh, overseas Chinese in the US, Singapore, Malaysia, Australia. In places like, say, the US and Canada, there were Chinese mining communities, but when the government created anti-Chinese legislation, they just blocked them out. For instance, the United States had the Chinese Exclusion Act. New Zealand seemed to have a more complex well, it's, system. It's probably important to, to point out that um, we talked about the guarantees that were made. Yeah. Well, that government, the system that made that, the Otago provincial government, was actually abolished. And so once that was abolished, all of a sudden, also, there wasn't so many people looking out for the Chinese anymore. So, yeah, all bets were kind of off. And then there was real anti-Chinese feeling among the working classes and unions were being developed, and there was a real fear of the yellow hordes coming from China. That was the know, words they used. Yeah, 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 Mongolian invasion, those sorts of traditional things that you have in Australia and China. Yeah. yeah, but also the Cantonese took with them yeah. some real traits, and they were very methodical and they worked together in teams, and they would, over, they would work over gold fields that Europeans had already gone over themselves and hadn't been so efficient. And the Cantonese came along, and in their big you know, teams found much more gold, so that created a lot of jealousy all of a sudden that these guys were finding gold places that Europeans had been a bit lazy around. And so all of a sudden that, that, that jealousy emerged because these guys were, were becoming more successful. So it's safe to say these were not just unskilled grunt labourers, these were people who brought a lot of uh, ingenuity. Yeah, ingenuity and endurance, but they weren't miners when they left here, they had no. to learn that when they came over. So it was a real... It was yeah. a, they, they brought their peasant skills though, you know, they were used to hard manual labour in teams working cooperatively and systematically. So the use of water in particular was quite noted. You know, they, they bought um, pump technology where they would really effectively use the resources that were available. Mm. And they didn't have capital resources to invest in machinery, so it was hard grunt labour, but they were very effective at it. Guangdong Radio and Television World Channel filmed a documentary, The Forgotten Canton Archive Crossing Guangzhou and New Zealand in 2014. We met a local-born Kiwi Chinese historian Leslie Wong, who dedicates himself into the preservation of the history of Chinese immigrants in New Zealand. The Chinese that came here looking for gold came here temporarily. They wanted to earn 100 pounds in money and leave New Zealand and go home reasonably wealthy. So they did not really want to stay. And some could not even make a fortune. They could not face the money lenders in China. And they died a lonely death here. We interviewed and have still been in touch with a colleague of yours, Leslie Wong, oh, yeah, and he, he made the point that the first Chinese to settle in Dunedin did not have the intention to stay. They were intending yeah. to be brief oh, yeah. laborers and oh, then yeah. leave. Why did they stay? Well, they didn't actually stay until much, much later. They began to develop a system of back and forth sojourns. Okay, so when you came to Otago in the 1870s, the goal was to get about 100 pounds worth of gold and it would usually take about four or five years. And then those men went back. And that's what they did. And then another... So it's a transient community, yeah. not really planting roots. But, but people from their same village would then come out in their place. You know, their brothers, their sons, their nephews. And some of the men made multiple sojourns. So they'd go back for a while, and then they'd come back. And you know, their villages prospered with the money they brought back with them and invested in houses and schools and towers and those sorts of things. And we've seen those as we've been traveling. We've been looking for those things. If we move forward through the generations, when was it that it's safe to say that who was the first uh, Chinese New Zealand, the, I guess you could say a Chiwi generation, to, to, see them, to see themselves as, this is our home, we belong here. Who, is the pe who were the people to identify themselves as a part of New Zealand, not just visitors? It's really the group that came in 1939 and 40 
as refugees from the Japanese invasion. Okay. And we because in all that period up to then, it had been just the men. It was a broken stem society, yeah. and the families were back in the home villages. The men would come back, marry, have a child, couple of children, go back, come back, back and forth, back and forth, and eventually, often, they would retire home when they, you know, were well set up enough. They they never thought of New Zealand as the ultimate destination until the 1930s when the Japanese invasion made things here much more problematic. Mm. Wives and children were brought out. At first temporarily, they were supposed to go back after the war, but in 1946 it was the Presbyterian Church that you've been dealing with who agitated on behalf of the Chinese community, let them stay. And they were advocates? Yeah, they were their advocates because at that point the New Zealand government was committed to sending them back when the war was over. And they were looking for immigrants elsewhere. They wanted English immigrants, they wanted Dutch immigrants. And the Presbyterian said, what about these Chinese? They've been great guys. And they said, hmm, all right. They can stay. So that cohort, and it was, you know, not enormous, but the children of that generation went through the New Zealand school system, learnt English, were, had a foot in the, you know, the old world and the new, and they are the first cohort of the New Zealand Chinese generation. People like Peter Chin, who became Dunedin's mayor, the first Chinese mayor. People like Jim Ning, that group. And they all made this big jump from being, you know, poor people on the margins of society working in laundries and market gardens and fruit shops. They went to university, they became doctors, they became lawyers, they became accountants, they became chemists, and they really lifted the whole community up to a completely different level in society. James Ng is a medical doctor and leading historian and archivist of the Chinese community in New Zealand. He has published a four volume history of Chinese in Otago, Windows on a Chinese Past. These works created a huge impact on locals' views on Chinese history in New Zealand. You mentioned uh, Professor Jim Ning. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, in the 1990s, you, uh, Sean, worked with him yep. for the Windows of the Chinese Past exhibit. Yep. Now, he's considered the, the OG, the pioneer of this particular field of research. Yes, I'd, I'd like to ask from you gentlemen, in the last two decades, how is the, how, how has this field of research changed in terms of information and awareness about this particular story? As someone that grew up in these areas, I always grew up knowing that there was a, a Chinese influence, mm -hmm. but no one ever really knew what that meant. And Jim's books, of all of a sudden, for my local small town museum uh, where I grew up, all of a sudden we were able to get information about who these people were, exact names, where they came from, and what they did. How, how old were you when this was going on? Where, I mean, were you like? In I was just a small boy when all of a sudden this information, when, when, when Jim, who actually um, grew up for a short time, his father was a laundryman in sort of our biggest town nearby. Um, and so Jim had that connection with our local community. But all of a sudden, things got brought to light. All of a sudden, we knew where they came. I mean, when you come from New Zealand, China's a long way away. We, you know, it's, it's one big country, and it's not until I've actually arrived here and realized how enormous it is. But all of a sudden we have these details and it's able to, uh, these details open our eyes as to exactly what, uh, what these people went through, the hardships. We always knew that they were given a bit of a hard time, but we didn't know how much of a hard time and how it was sanctioned by the government to a degree. Till now, Chinese immigration to New Zealand has not stopped, but the situation is not the same as 100 years ago. Kiwi Chinese are divided into old Chinese and new Chinese. What's that all about, you might be asking. The Chinese who are coming to New Zealand today are not coming to live these miserable, struggling lives. They're coming to buy property. They're coming to go to university. They're coming to invest. Trade is so important between these two countries. For the new generation today who are not struggling in the same way as the old timers did, are they aware of these stories? Well, it's probably two parts to that. I mean, up till 1986, all of New Zealand's Chinese migrants were from Guangdong and they were part of this yeah. gold seeker and on, you know, the, the successors of that. And then the government of New Zealand changed its immigration program and we had a massive influx of Chinese from all sorts of other places. So what we call the old Chinese community suddenly became a minority within a minority. And that really was difficult for them because, you know, some of them had been, you know, in New Zealand for seven generations, mm -hmm. but now you know, people got annoyed with Chinese drivers on the streets, you know, been a bit uncertain about New Zealand conditions and so, you know, it revived a lot of the old anti-Chinese things and directed it indiscriminately against new Chinese and old Chinese. Now this is more to the fore in the North Island and places like Auckland. It doesn't so much impact on Dunedin, which is the old Chinese centre, but they moved out from there. So we've got quite a small old Chinese community and then a slightly different new Chinese community 